So, um, Moyen, uh, I don't know how many people saw Richard's last talk, very nicely done. Um, but unlike him, he had to go running around trying to figure out, okay, how do I say uh, Moyen in, in Luxembourgish? Um, I actually lived here for a year, a number of years ago. And um, yeah, it was quite fun because uh, at that time, um, we didn't have, we had to tune a large system and we didn't have any tooling. So we had to build all of our own tooling to uh, help uh, to, to build the system. It was actually the first engagement I did with Jack Shirazi. And I don't know if you guys know, actually know who Jack Shirazi is, but he is the original author of um, uh, Java Performance Tuning. And uh, that was actually done on some, uh, based on some work that uh, Jack and I and a few other people did together um, at a nice bank here. Actually, I think I see one other person that was a colleague there. Uh, in the sitting near the front. Um, anyways, this talk here is really about, uh, it's about moving to G1GC and um, first I have the nice uh, obligatory slide about, um, um, about me. Um, primarily just been uh, doing a lot of uh, Java performance tuning for the, the, the last number of years um, and write and speak about it and uh, have co-founded a tooling company called uh, JClarity. Now, um, some announcements here to start off with. So there's things that Oracle doesn't really want you to know, or at least they're doing things, and they're not really telling anyone about it, so, but there's um, evidence, evidence of it around. So first, um, G1GC will be the default collector in Java 9. So if you're not specifying your garbage collector today, uh, do know that that's going to change under the hood uh, for you uh, when you actually do move to Java 9. The other big news is that uh, CMS will be deprecated. Now, this is something that just came out over the weekend, so this is actually uh, completely brand new news, and it has never really been discussed um, with, the, um, with the community at large. So, uh, Oracle just decided that Maintaining CMS would be uh, too expensive, so they're going to segregate it from the code. Of course, we'll still get support, but probably we'll get it from people like Red Hat or SAP or um, other contributors like that, possibly Twitter. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, the question is like, well, what is the impact all of this is going to have on your application's performance? Well, we've spent uh, the last couple of years now moving different uh, customers to using the G1GC uh, collector. And what we found is that it's really, really been a mixed bag. So in this talk here, I want to give everyone like a quick rundown as to how the G1GC collector actually functions and then try to look at some data to see um, what are the things that, that we've been looking at and what are the things that we've been seeing can help uh, when you're uh, tuning an application. Right. So. The first thing to know is that um, we're moving away from what I would call uh, generational collectors to things that are known as regional collectors. So the question is, you know, we, you know what do these things look like and, and, and how do they work and, and how do they perform? Um, so, you know, with the generational collector, we had a number of different uh, pools, uh, generally four. And what, what happened is that we would use one of them uh, as a nursery and then we'd use the other pools to, uh, to hold on to data that, as it aged, right? So the garbage collector would uh, do a mark and sweep. And in the case of the young generational spaces, it would do an evacuation or a copy to another space. And um, what would happen in, when we uh, did a mark and sweep on tenured space or the older space, then we'd get in what's known as an in-place uh, collection. And uh, that would free up all the space and return it to the... Um, <clears throat> return it to the application. So why do we need another collector? Well, first, CMS is very difficult to tune uh, for a lot of people. Uh, there's a number of different tuning strategies, but generally it's just a, it, you know, there's a whole bunch of like esoteric, very difficult to understand uh, parameters that you generally have to use in order to get it to perform well. And even then, if you can actually get it to perform well, um, well, you, then and you try to scale it up, all of a sudden, you know, things break down because there's a lot of 
things that happen that are just linear to the size of the memory space that you're trying to collect. You know, and, you know, it's, there's here's an example here: T lab waste target percent, right? I mean, so to know what that is, you really have to have a deep understanding of how uh, the CMS collectors' memory spaces are actually structured. Also, completely unpredictable. Well, we find that it actually is predictable. Um, and, uh, you know, you can make some predictions, but, you know, that's a completely different talk, right? So with the G1, GC was, you know, the first thing they wanted to do was, like, break this dependency between, you know, the algorithmic uh, com complexity and, and, and the size of, of the space that they're trying to collect. Make it easier to tune and make it actually function out of the box so that you don't actually have to tune it. So fewer configuration options uh, in, in general. But, um, you know, did they do it? Well, you know, the problem is, is if, if it works out of the box, it's great. If it doesn't, you got a real problem. It, it really is a, a difficult collector to tune. And plus, um, I think, and this only happened in the last uh, couple of weeks, I think I finally had the epiphany, the aha moment that says, now I know how to tune this thing. Uh, because before that, we we're just looking at this going like, okay, uh, we don't really know how to tune it. First, the implementation has been changing. And second, you know, it's just difficult to get a lot of, of uh, companies to say, can we experiment with a new garbage collector in your production environment? Yeah, people aren't exactly very happy for you to be doing that. But we actually found a couple of customers that said, sure, go ahead. You can do whatever you want to our pr production environment. We don't care. And, um, you know, that allowed, us, allowed me to run some very nice experiments um, that uh, gave us some really good information. Finally, okay, so what does this all look like? Well, um, we're going to take the G1 GC heap, so it's a contiguous space allocated in the JVM, just as before, but instead of breaking it up into like four or five spaces, we're going to break it up into approximately 2,048 uh, funny little regions. And then, you know, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put all of these regions on a free list. And so what happens is as your application starts uh, making allocation requests, it's going to first go to the free list, get a region, and then it's going to start allocating into that region. When it fills the region, then it'll go get the next one. When it uses up all of its, um, the number of regions that have been allocated for it, then we're going to start a garbage collection or, or reclamation cycle, right? Um, so you know, there's some sample calculations there, and you can see the region sizes here are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, or 64 megabytes in size. Now, fragmenting the heap into these small regions actually causes its own set of issues that you have to cope with. So really what I want to do, instead of going through the next set of slides, is look at this, um, th this uh, visualization that I just uh, put together. Um, now let me just see if we can get the, probably going to have to work like this for a second. Okay. Are we okay? I think we're okay. Let's go over here. And let me run this little thing here and just show you what's going on here. Okay. Um, so um, what this thing is doing is it's actually uh, reading data from a GC log that we got from a, a, a system, a production system. And you can see that there's all these little squares on the screen just sort of bouncing around, uh, doing all kinds of fin funny things, right? So um, all of the regions are going to be tagged uh, when they're allocated. Um, they're going to be categorized as being part of either a an Eden region, right? And that's the green areas. Um, a survivor region, which is the yellow areas. Uh, or a tenured region, which is the blue area. Now that leaves the black, which are uh, unallocated regions. And you can also see there's a coral red combination. Um, these are known as humongous regions. So the coral is a humongous start, and the red is a humongous continuation. So in this particular case here, I have an eight megabyte um, region size, but the customer in this case is uh, is, uh, has many allocations that are greater than eight megabytes. 
So every time you see an allocation greater than eight megabytes, uh, you see a coral region with some red regions actually show up um, in, in the screen here. So we're going, in this case, through 16 hours worth of, uh, uh, of data at about a frame rate of about uh, 200 milliseconds. Oh, I don't think that was an NPE, Richard, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Something else is happening in there. But anyways, um, you know, so that's the, that's the end of the data run. And you can see that um, what they've done in terms of the allocation, which is quite interesting, um, um, is that the um, Eden um, regions tend to come from the bottom of the list and the tenured regions tend to come from the top of the list. And what I was actually surprised to see was the humongous regions seem to be intermixed with the tenured regions. And, and, and that's really a problem because um, if I have a humongous allocation and, and I don't have enough continuous blocks to actually satisfy that particular allocation, then what happens is that's going to actually trigger a garbage collection cycle. So if I actually just move on to, you know, so, you know and, what, and what's, you know, is, is this a real problem? If we actually just move on to this particular view here, let's see if I can make it a bit smaller to make it bigger so you can read the numbers in the back there. Okay, no worries. Okay. Um, then you can see that, uh, okay, so, you know, what, are, what am I looking at here? Well, basically what I'm looking at is saying, like, okay, here's, here's all of the garbage collection cycles. So here's my... Uh, young generational collections uh, in this particular, uh, for this particular application, we had 2,600, sorry, 2,768 uh, young generational collections running. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, the, each of these come with a pause time. So, the, you know, the total pause time for all these uh, was 328 uh, seconds. If we look over here, we can see that our application throughput was 99.3%. So this is a really, really, uh, you know, that's a really good percentage in terms of application throughput. That means that the garbage collector was interfering with the application's ability to run 0.7% of the time. Um, so that this is actually running really efficiently. But if, you know, if we want to try to improve the situation, then we need to find out, you know, what is the problem? Uh, you know, what's, what, what can we do in order to make this thing run better? Well, if we look at the heap um, utilization after the garbage collection, we can see that, you know, that's all nice and stable, but, you know, every, everything is good here, but, you know, what we're actually looking at is, okay, so what's causing all of these garbage collections to occur? We can look at the GC cause, and you can see I have a bunch of things down here, so GC locker initiated GC, well, let's ignore that one, just say that's a normal GC that's happening that's been delayed. We have a just normal garbage collection, so the, the, the green and the yellows are just all normal garbage collections, but we do have a red thing showing up here, which is like a metadata uh, GC threshold, so I'll talk about that a little later on. But you can see that in this case here, we have a huge number of what's known as humongous allocations that actually could not be satisfied. Um, and when they, you know, because they weren't satisfied, the, the allocation request wasn't satisfied, they would trigger a garbage collection. Because what the garbage collector is now trying to do is collect um, all of the regions in the space that is, you know, the young generational collector will run, it will try to collect uh, all of the regions and it will naturally do a compaction and hopefully at the end of the collection we'll end up with enough free regions in the, in the free list that we can actually uh, satisfy the humongous allocation. If we can't do this after a young generational collection, then what's going to happen is that this is eventually going to degrade into a full collection. And when it degrades into a full collection, of course, that's going to, that's going to be very, very expensive. And especially if you have very large heaps, which, is this, which this collector is designed to, to work with, then you could have like a, a multi-minute pause happening in the middle of your application run. Of course, that would be... Um, uh, a really uh, terrible event. Okay, so let's go back into um, the slides and see what's going on. Whoops, make it smaller. Yeah, okay. So this is some of the stuff we covered, so I'm not going to cover it again. So what is a humongous allocation? Well, it's allocation that is larger than half a region size. 
And you can see here, um, there's one humongous allocation in this particular uh, slide deck with a number of uh, young generational collections. Now, um, when we actually get into a garbage collection um, cycle, um, a young generational collection cycle, or a cycle that's only going to consider uh, young generational regions, um, we're going to see that th that collection is broken down into a number of different phases. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to return back to this particular view here and just look at the different phases that, that come in here, come into play here. So, uh, well, oops, I got a little traction. So let's just take a look at the, at the GC log itself. Um, so here's the GC log that we're actually feeding from and you can see that um, here is uh, the description of the young uh, generational collection right here. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different data in here and you can see that there seem to be some parallel phases as, as well as some sequential phases that, that, that are happening. And the, these phases really describe uh, all the work that the garbage collector I is actually engaged in. So if I can just go back to uh, this particular view here, we can see that the phases are actually showing up right here. So we have, um, yeah. get it bigger here so you can read the, the font size, right? So there's, there's, you can see what's going on here. So, so basically we have a parallel phase. Um, there's a clear card table phase. We'll talk about that in a second. There's a code uh, root purge phase, a code uh, root fix up page. So these are all just different activities that the garbage collector has to do to make sure that all of the pointers are in alignment after I've moved all the data around so that, you know, we don't get any uh, problems with the uh, pointers pointing to the wrong stuff. Um, more interestingly, we can look at the, uh, at the parallel phases and we can see that um, there's a whole bunch, of, these, these are all the things that we have to do to go, get the collection done. So um, let me start with the update remembered sets. Okay, so if you think about how garbage collection works, right, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do a scan for roots. I need to find all the starting points as to where I'm going to traverse the object graphs to mark which objects are live and to be able to identify, uh, well, in, this, in these type of collectors, we don't, we don't actually identify what's dead, but we want to identify the live ones, which means we need to do a mark phase. So to start the mark phase, I'm going to do a scan for roots. Um, so where are the GC roots for any particular region? Well, they can be in any other region in heap, plus a bunch of other places. Okay. So if you think about it, that means that every time I do a scan for roots, if I have to go through every single region to scan to find them, then basically I'm back to the same old problem. The problem that I have is that the scan time is going to be linear with the uh, size of the heap. That's one thing that we didn't want, right? Um, okay, so how are we going to solve this problem? Well, what we're going to do is every time I make a reference to an object in the region, I'm going to record that fact in something called a remembered set. Now, the remembered sets themselves, um, if, you, if you represented them naively, would be sparse, undisciplined, directed graphs. Um, and the key word in that phrase should be sparse, which means um, wasted space. So in order to conserve space, what we're going to do is we're going to, tr uh, we're going to come up with this complex data structure called a remembered set, but we don't want the mutator thread or your application thread to actually go through the process of updating this. So your mut mutator thread is going to dump that, the fact that I'm pointing from, you know, from foo to bar for in one region to another into, um, the, into this queue, and then we're going to have remembered set update threads that are going to read from the queue and they're actually going to update the remembered sets. Okay? And now when we do our scan for roots, what we're going to do is just go to the remembered set for that region, bang, there's the bulk of our root set. So that solves that particular problem. Of course, there's a cost. The cost is, you know, cost us to update the remembered set and every time we mutate something, then of course we have to update that, uh, that information in the appropriate remembered set. Um, 
And since this mutation is ending up in a queue, what happens is that we have to have uh, threads that are, gonna, that are going to drain the queue. And um, as we drain the queue, you know, if we have a garbage collection happening and it's not done, the garbage collection can't start until the queue is drained. And therefore, we have a parallel phase called update uh, remembered sets. And really, this is all this is saying is the garbage collectors are now going to come in and finish the job of updating the remembered sets. So they're going to completely wipe out the queue. Okay? Um, so there's the scan the remembered sets. That's doing, uh, you know, doing root scanning. Of course, we have code root scanning. So that's another source of GC roots. External root scanning. Again, you know, the, another source of GC roots that's uh, like stack frames, registers, th you know, things like that, right? Um, and then, after we've done the actual mark, um, we have to copy the object. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a region, we're going to take all of the live data in there, we're going to copy it into another region. Um, as it turns out, um, this is yet another problem that we keep running into, is just the the object copy costs. And there's some really intricate interplays that actually can make this copy cost worse uh, over time. And of course, we have some termination since it's the parallel uh, phase. Um, and there's some other phases here that didn't show up in this particular log for some reason, so we actually don't see them. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, that's, that's really the bulk of, of what's happening. Um, so if we look at the parallel phase here as a percent, you can see, you know, it's like, okay, what's all that red stuff at the top? Well, you know, so that means that our, that our pause time is now being dominated by object copy costs, right? So we need to bring to, into play, you know, some tricks or some way of coping with this particular um, uh, problem. Um, we can look at the other phase percents if you want, but you can see that they're fairly insignificant, so we're not really um, too... Uh, too concerned about what's what's going on here now. Um, so this is this is essentially the, the the guts of the young generational collection. So that looks that takes care of young gen and uh, survivor spaces, right? Um, so the question is, you know, so what happens with tenured space? Well, with tenured space, uh, what is going to happen is that we're going to do a mark of tenured space. And as we do the mark, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate an occupancy threshold, right? And then I'm going to sort the regions by the occupancy threshold. And I'm going to add those regions to the list of regions that the young generational collector has to then sweep, okay? Um, so I'm going to start this by invoking what's known as an initial mark. That's going to be piggybacked on a young generational collection. And what happens uh, next is after I do the mark, and I do, you know, I've, I've got my candidate set of regions that I need to collect because they are going to be at a certain level of fullness or emptiness after I've marked them. Uh, so these are the guys that I, that I want to mark. I'm going to do a number of mixed collections, right? Up to eight mixed collections. So I'm going to take that set and I'm going to divide it up into um, a maximum of eight chunks. And I'm going to say, okay, not only do the young generational regions, but also do this number of, of uh, old generational regions when I do a mixed collection, okay? Now, when does the initial uh, mark start? Well, it starts when the heap reaches what's known as an IHOP, which is initiating heap occupancy percentage. Uh, the default value is now 45%, but do check the version you're using if you want to use G1. Well, we always recommend that you go to the newest version uh, because they're still doing a lot of bug fixes and performance enhancements um, in each of the versions. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, do go to the, you know, check to your version because these values tend to change. Now, the ripeness threshold for if a region is going to be collected or not, this is a tenured region, is um, 85%. And that's changed from 65%, which means that if the region is more than 85% full, right, I'm not going to consider it a candidate for being collected, you know. And the reason is, is that 
um, if you look at the adaptive sizing information that you can also print when the, when the collector is running, you're going to see what it's doing is it's trying to build up a collection set that has a predictable pause time. So it knows how much time it takes to collect each region. And so what it will do is it's going to add all the young generational regions in there. It's going to say, okay, we've got a 200 millisecond time budget here. I can collect all of those in 100 milliseconds. So that means I can add 100 milliseconds of work to that particular workload. So now I can go through the regions and I can say, ah, empty, free, back, on the C, free, uh, back in the free list, right? 10% full. That's going to take a millisecond, add it to the budget, add it to the collection set. And it'll just keep adding until it fills up the time budget. Okay? And, that, and, that, and that's pretty much how it's going to decide how to build a, a, a collection set. And that's how we get predictability in the, in, in the, um, in, in the, um, in the collector. Now, this 200 millisecond time budget we've given it is a suggestion. It's a hint. It tries to do all of its configurations and calculations based on this 200 millisecond time budget. If it cannot meet the 200 millisecond time budget, it'll exceed it. Because at the end of the day, you have to have memory for your application to function, which means the garbage collector has to run to completion, right, to, in order to recover memory to give it to your application. Okay. So um, that's a little bit of basic about um, the young generational collector, how it works. This is the mark sweep, uh, sorry, the mark phase in tenured. And you can see there's red phases here, which are stop the world. And there's green phases here, which run concurrently uh, with the application. So this looks a lot like the CMS collector, if you're familiar with it. So reclaiming, we've covered. That's a remembered set. This is the reset refinement queue that I spoke about. And you can see there's different colors here, because at different thresholds, the VM is going to act more and more aggressively in terms of doing the R set refinement. Um, so if you only have a few things in there, I'm not going to do anything. But if you have a lot in there, I'm now going to involve the application threads in, in doing the R set refinement phase. And there's um, you know, levels of aggression in between. So in terms of like how do you configure all of this, well, <clears throat> here's the flags that you generally want to use. You want to turn on the collector, um, you want to set a max heap size, and you want to give it a pause time goal. Um, generally, uh, the pause time goal of 200 milliseconds is a good starting point. That's the default value. And you can play with that uh, if you need to later. <clears throat> of course, you also want to turn on uh, GC logging. And to turn on a reasonable level of GC logging, we recommend that you use these number of flags. Flags you might want to use. Now, the, <clears throat> at the each, of collect, each collection cycle, what's going to happen is that um, um, it's going to estimate how many regions it should give young generational space, right? And um, the idea here is to control pause time. In order to control pause time, what you want to do is try to make the space as small as you possibly can. So it's going to adaptively um, give you fewer and fewer regions until the overhead gets to the point where it's going to say, okay, now we need to add more regions. So it's going to find some balance in there, right? Um, generally, um, the size of Eden, right, the small size of Eden, Eden that you're going to see is 5%. And sometimes that's just way too small. So sometimes what we want to do is make that bigger. And so what we'll do is we will come in and, and set the G1 new size percent to actually make that bigger. And there's, there's reasons for doing that. Um, mostly, well, I'll, I'll get into it when I can show you some graphics that, that'll explain all of that. Um, flags you should think twice about using, uh, G1 mix GC count target. Like that, that's for the number of mixed GC collections. So mixed GC being I'm collecting young gen and tenured uh, regions. That's set to eight. Um, I'm actually changing my mind about this, uh, but that's just because, uh, like I said, we're still learning how to tune this thing and learning what seems to work and what you know it seems to be problematic. 
uh, flags you should never use. Um, you know, you can look at the slides afterwards and, and see, but these, these are things that are, uh, if you see anyone using this, they're probably speculatively, or they've used, um, I don't know, Stack Overflow to tune their JVM. This is really not what I call evidence-based uh, tuning. So things that give the G1 grief, RSET refinement, right? Um, object copy time, what we saw in that particular GC graph, uh, uh, sorry, that um, the charts that object copy time was the, uh, was the dominating activity. So if I want to reduce pause times, I need to do something to reduce object copy times. And there doesn't seem to be, you know, there's really, you know, what can you say about object copy time? So, I'll, you know, when I wrote the slides, I said not much, but I think I've got a lot more to say about it. I'll say that in a second. Humongous allocations can cause young generational collections, um, and they can, that can degrade into a full GC if, if, if you have a problem. There's this also is, this issue called floating garbage. So because we're not collecting all of the regions, there's still dead objects in those regions, and they could be pointing to data in other regions. And if they're pointing to data in other regions, then the data in other regions will be considered live, even though it's dead. So these things are like zombies sitting in your heap. The only way to get rid of them is to force the collection of that particular region. And, and we can see this uh, like sawtooth uh, pause time behavior in the, in the charting um, that you, you'll see it after a full GC. Since a full GC is exact and gets rid of everything, um, then you'll see the pause time without the floating garbage. And as you accumulate full, uh, uh, the uh, floating garbage, the pause time will go up and up and up and up and up. And then you'll hit another full GC and it'll drop down again. And you just, so it'll just keep going like this, boom, boom. Right? So if we're seeing these ty this type of behavior, then, then one of the things we can do is just be more aggressive in you know, forcing more regions to, to be collected. So I use Cassandra. Use it out of the, just out of the box tuning and then just said, okay, let's pump this thing up so that we're using 100% of the CPU, right? Not the way you're going, you should run a benchmark. But the reason we ran the benchmark is that what I wanted to do is see what the cost of each of the collection was, right? So uh, the back, backhanded way of doing that is saying like, if the garbage collector is running, our application isn't running, so therefore the more the garbage collector runs, the less throughput we're gonna get in our application. So I can actually measure the throughput here. And you can see here's a chart, and the point way over there on the left, that's the CMS collector. And that gave us the best throughput. When we actually um, look at, um, you know, what gave us the, um, the best throughput, it's that little low, um, you know, it's, it's the, the second run, right, uh, from the left. And, you know, the question is, you know, what do we do in that case in order to get this thing to run better? Well, the dominating cost in this particular benchmark um, happened to be um, object copy costs. And what I did was did some work to reduce the object copy costs, um, right? So basically, how do you do that? Well, I don't know if anyone's seen this thing here. This is known as the weak generational hypothesis. What the weak generational hypothesis states is that the data, is that data dies quickly Right? Generally, within a few machine cycles, most of the data is dereferenced before it leaves the CPU. Um, or if it lives longer, it's going to tend to live a long time. Right? And you can see that hump on the end is just basically long, longer lived uh, data. Most applications have this particular behavior. You'll see it all the time, right? Um, so we'll see that, uh, you know, we'll, have, we'll create a lot of data but we'll only keep retain a very, very small uh, amount of it uh, for a longer period of time. Now, as a side effect of this particular graph, what it says is that the amount of data, live data in heap at any one point in time is the, basically the area under this curve. And that is a constant for some definition of constant over time, okay? Um, cool, we can use that information. Right? If we want to reduce object copy costs on something like a batch run, um, 
then all we have to do is reduce the number of times that we collect. Right? Because it doesn't matter if I collect in 30 seconds or a minute, the amount of live data is going to remain the same. Now, the amount of dead data is, of course, going to increase, but we don't really care about that. Because the dead data is never marked, it's never swept. We don't actually consider the dead data during a collection. The cost of a collection is going to be dominated by the amount of live data. Um, okay. And so this has actually been a very, this is a very, been a very successful strategy. It's just slow the frequency of garbage collections. It's not free. Unfortunately, it's not free. Um, if you slow the rates of collections, um, you're going to have to have a larger heap, which means you're going to have to have more remembered sets, which means the cost of the scan for roots is going to increase. And there's other costs that are actually going to increase as a result of having this uh, much larger heap. And um, so, you know, is this going to work every time? Maybe, maybe not. And generally what happens is that if it doesn't work, we're going to find that the dominating cost is going to be remembered set processing. And at that point, we seem to be completely screwed. There doesn't seem to be anything you can do uh, about that particular problem. You know, so that's pretty much an issue for um, that, 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 we've yet to, that, that we've yet to solve. In terms of the floating garbage, uh, what I've done is trying to uh, uh, configure the collector to run um, more frequently. Um, well, to run old generational collections or old generational mark phases more frequently uh, and reduce the threshold required to actually um, have a region collected. And I'm going, you know, trying some experiments right now with increasing the mixed GC ratio uh, to try to make sure that we can still work within reasonable uh, pause time budgets. Yeah. So um, there's a number of these different strategies that we're trying to try to see what we can do to, uh, to reduce the, uh, the pause times effect of the garbage collector or the G1 garbage collector on our application, you know. So have they been successful so far? Well, some have been successful, others have been rather frustrating. The, you know, the Cassandra benchmark was uh, very frustrating because all the data was saying do something and every time we did that, um, then what would happen is that the, uh, um, that some other aspect of the G1 collector would misbehave. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're left scratching your head again, okay, how are we going to work around this particular problem now? and uh, without affecting, uh, you know, some other uh, aspect of how the G1 collector uh, actually works. Anyways, um, I could probably show you more data, uh, but I think uh, given the amount of time we have left, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut it off right now and just say, ask if there's any questions uh, from anyone in the audience here. Nothing? Is it, uh, let me ask you some questions then. Has anyone actually tried using G1? Only Richard. Anybody else? Yeah, you? And what's your experience been so far then? So what's your experience? Oh, you have a question? Okay, sure, fire it off. Shout it out. I'm sorry, can you, can you Yeah. It's okay now? Yeah. Uh, you said at the beginning that Java 9 will deal by default with the uh, UGC one. Uh, if you keep the old, the old GC, uh, have you made some? Have you faced some uh, drawback or something like that using the the old GC with Java nine? Can you 
you just answer in the microphone? <laughs> right, forgot. Okay, so um, I'm not sure I completely understood all of that question, so I'm going to answer the question I think I understood. Sorry about that. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the CMS collector isn't going away. There's just too many people that are really highly dependent upon it. Um, so there's now talk about how they're going to sequester the CMS cl collector code out of OpenJDK so that, you know, the people who still want it can still uh, use it. Um, and uh, I, I honestly think that, you know, this is actually going to be a good thing because it means that we're going to get some of the fixes that we need to the CMS collector that we just haven't been able to push through before because Oracle's been worried about maintenance costs. Um, so, for instance, Google SAP have a nice uh, patch uh, that should actually help uh, make the CMS function better. I know Twitter has actually created a number of different patches uh, for uh, the CMS collector that actually make it perform much better. Um, so, I, you know, so the collector is still going to be there. It's, I, if it's going to end up in an Oracle JD, JVM build, I'm not sure. I mean, that's information I just don't have. Uh, it looks to me like it isn't. That that's going to be my guess right now. Which means that you might actually have to go to an open JDK build in order to get access to the CMS collector. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen before Java 10, though. Right, so we're still talking like three or four years out. So I, I, so I think there's a reasonable amount of time for people to uh, decide if they can move forward to the G1 or if they're going to have to do something uh, to, you know, to to stay on the using the collector technology that they're using. Um, the other collectors are going to remain the same. So the parallel collector, the, like throughput collectors, will still be there. Serial collectors will still be there. So if you're worried about running these things on, like, on small devices. Um, then you know the, the, they should run perfectly well. I would I would say that the G1 is not for a small device. It, you want uh, lots of cores, uh, lots of RAM when you're using this particular collector. Okay, so your collectors will be there if you've configured things. It'll work the same um, for a while, anyways. Okay, and Richard. Am I aware of any major G1 changes? Uh, no, there's just a whole bunch of tweaks coming in. I, there's an, I mean, the p thing we pointed out is that there's a number of applications that just don't work well with G1 and for one reason or another. And so they're, uh, you know, the Oracle internal people are trying to figure out why and they'll try to make adjustments to the G1 in order to, to do this. I mean, to me, the, the, biggest, the biggest problems are object copy and our set management, right? Because our set management is actually a nonlinear problem, and it's nonlinear to the size of the region, so it's, it's, it's really a problem, you know, that needs to be done. Yeah, I have a question. S Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so, if, uh, just ask this one: Is there the type of application that doesn't react well to G1? Um, anything that does a lot of serialization. If you're doing serialization to off heap, um, those will tend to be problematic. So, um, that's as one type of application that can be a real problem. This particular application I'm showing you does a lot of serialization. It's in the middle of a cluster, sending data to other JVMs. So, there's messaging in there. If you have large messages and things like that, then those will tend to be uh, problematic. Um, and I would say that anything that has high allocation rates tends to be very uh, problematic. So I'm going to strike a blow to the immu immutability crowd because if there's anything that will put pre memory pressure on an application and the garbage collector, it will be a, an application that dogmatically uses um, immutability instead of properly encapsulating this, uh, the state behind proper abstractions. Um, okay, other question then? Yeah, um, it's not directly about G1, but I was wondering if uh, having these new uh, type of memory allocation and, and garbage collecting, if there's a chance that the JVM maybe will be able to shrink memory at some point in time. Um, um, Would the uh, who cares? I mean, a terabyte box is so cheap these days. I mean, I don't really care. Why do you want to shrink memory? 
I mean, it's a, it's a nice academic problem, but in, in, real, in the real world, it, it's like no one really cares about that. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what I was asking, because... Um, you, I mean, you could technically do it. I mean, the, the, the thing is, like, with heat fragmentation, the way you see it, with the way, you know, the, what this program says is that I got shit at the top, shit at the bottom, and because I got, I got I, you know, I'd have to move everything up in order to, you know, free, because I can only give back from the top, and it has to be contiguous, and no data in there. And if I have pointers in there, they're basically you're screwed, right? And, um, you know, so, I mean, you could do it by pushing things around, but, you know, like I said, it's really an academic problem. It, it doesn't really have any practical value in, in live production environments, you know, per se. Uh, mostly, I mean, to, I mean, to do that, it's like, you know, add VMs to your cluster and get rid of them, right? I mean, that's a good way of reducing memory. Just take a VM out of your cluster. Okay, we're done? Excellent. Thank you, guys. <laughs>